Well, four years ago, I took my first shot at a type of hunting that I didn't even know existed a year prior to that. It's called the spring hooter hunt, and it involves climbing through the wettest, nastiest country in southeast Alaska in search of the ventriloquist-like sooty grouse. <laughs> Trudging through miles of rugged rainforest taught me that shooting birds out of trees is not as easy as you'd think, especially when you can't even find them in the first place. I vowed to come back with help from a friend. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. After a miserable and mostly unsuccessful attempt at sooty grouse hunting, I started searching for someone who might serve as my mentor. Many phone calls later, I learned of a friend of a friend of my brother's who had a friend who's something of a sooty grouse specialist in Juneau, Alaska. And I found her. She hunts alone or with her dog, Helga, and has probably logged more hours on sooty grouse than any other person living or dead. After a year of careful coaxing, I finagled an invitation from Barb to join her on an April hunt in her favorite haunt. How long ago did you start doing this? Probably 25 years. Last year was the first time I ever went out and tried to find one by myself, and it was just like misery. I found one grouse. Do you hear birds who, and you're like, oh, I'm not even gonna bother, he's so far yeah, away? Yeah, right, okay. I do I that. think I was going after those ones. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> We're 300 miles north of where I hunted last year, but still in the same national forest, a testament to the magnitude and splendor of Tongass. Right away, I lay it all out for Barb. I don't know a thing. I'm Luke, she's Yoda, these birds are ghosts. So how many feet do you usually climb before you hear one? Well, I go by time. Uh, you go by el time elevation? Yeah. <laughs> 45 minutes sometimes before I hear one, but I know we're going to get into one. So I'm not that good at but, judging our but height. up a ways. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So don't get disappointed if we don't hear anything for a while. There they you are. You know what? I'm like beyond disappointed oh, okay. <laughs> in my life. So do you ever uh, run into another grouse hunter? Not back here, I never have. Never have? Oh, there's one. Do you feel that that's a bird you can find? Oh, absolutely. Really? Pretty much if we can hear them, if it's not an echo situation. So you feel like that's not an echo for sure? Huh, yeah, it's a bird. We'll go, we'll go find him. Well, we'll go get under the trees. Whether we'll find him, I don't know. Really? Yeah. Well, how far do you think he is? I think he's probably at least as far as we've come, maybe oh, a little bit further. I got you. So how, if you were going to go like, how narrow could you get where you think he is? From this angle right here, I would say like right in there. What I would do is go up just a little bit higher and work across because I like to start out just a little bit above so I can work my way down to where the tree is. Yeah. Yeah, he's not too far. Really? We're in his area. Oh yeah, sounds totally different from right here. So where do you think he is? If they followed a pattern, you'd say they're in the tallest, thickest one out there. So start looking in that one, but he can, he can surprise you and be in some others too. That's kind of what's fun back here is they're tricky. When I'm by myself, I give myself an hour and then I give up. weirdest sound. It is. Like you imagine like a sound, right? How it seems like the sound has like a spot where it's made. This is like the source of the sound isn't like here. It's like this sphere of 
a sound. But I wonder before how many times I did get under one and didn't do what Barb is doing right now, which is lying on her back, studying the treetops from every possible angle. I think I thought more like it would just be that there's the bird, and that's clearly not the case. Last year, it took me four days to find a single bird, but Barb just led me to one before 9 a.m. Oh, there's that sucker right there. Where she leads, I'll follow. After barely an hour of hiking and glassing, Barb has led me to our first bird. I can just see the tail going way up in a thick old patch of limbs. Before you can even think about getting set up to be shooting straight overhead, he moves an inch. And you just had to start from scratch. Ah, come on. Did you find him, Barb? Yep, he's here. He's your bird. <laughs> wow. But check out his tail. He's got a really pretty tail. I like those really nice feathers. This is glossy. So how often will you find him and never get a shot? When I go out, it's not unusual for me to have run into five birds, but only take home three. Well, I wouldn't have got him. I would have walked away. Yeah. I would have started thinking that my mind was playing tricks on me, and I would have been up to the top of the hill thinking I was wrong about where I thought he was. I spent my hunt last year hiking in circles, but I never thought to stay put and search with my eyes rather than my feet. Even this one little trick is making me rethink my whole approach to these birds. We head in the direction of a hoot that Barb heard while I was studying that last bird. Being in this kind of topography, just like temperate rainforest, you know, hunting small game, it's just a great excuse to get out and wander around in some pristine, gorgeous land. I haven't had this problem yet. Mm -mm. <laughs> I can still hear hooters, you know, but they're a distant. I, I can just hear the echoing yeah. of them. We didn't pass it by, did we? Mm -mm. Imagine spending four straight days like this. There you go. So he's up that way. Yeah. Yep. It feels like a chase, you know? Like, it feels like a two and a half hour chase. But it's not a chase, because he's never moved. It's just like a chase in your own brain around. I feel like this could drive someone insane. Like, when I go home at night, I do a hear these in my sleep. Once we got here and found his group of trees, I thought we'd just find him within seconds. I feel like I'm hanging Christmas ornaments on these things, man. I feel like it's just like I can just see it all and touch it all, but cannot find his bird. Oh, 
I finally found him. Wow. Hey, Barb. Yeah? You got a shot from where you are? Yeah, he's, a, he's not bad. I guess I'll give it a try. take turns cooking a meal of grouse to compare how we like to do it, and I volunteer to go first. Do you keep the rocks out of your gizzards? Oh, no, what do you do with yeah. them? Yeah, oh, do you just give them to, put them in my bag and I'm gonna clean up. They're just kind of interesting to look at. You but, hang on to them? Yeah. I'm going caveman style. Fire, sticks, meat. So your dad used to cook them like this? Yeah. So what would you guys be doing when you'd get one? Oh, uh, just hiking. He wouldn't purposely be grouse hunting. But he'd carry a 22 or something? Uh, 44. He'd shoot their heads off. With a 44? Yeah, he's, he was that accurate. Like a marksman? Mm-hmm. Right, let's see. This is done or not. That's perfect. Try it out. Oh. The breast is nice and moist. So your husband thinks they taste like trees? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Specifically, the one they sit in. Yeah, I wouldn't say it tastes like spruce, but it does taste like the woods, you know? It's very good, though. Mm hmm So in a given spring, how many city grouse do you think you eat? At least a dozen, I, and I do share. There, I do have people, friends who do like them. So Is I that right? I'll so you give them to friends? Some of the meat, yeah. But most people that I know really don't care for it. Really? Yeah. So much of it's just like what you're accustomed to. Yeah. You know? I think that's true. I came out here because I was curious about sooty grouse. But after hunting with Barb, I'm finding her just as interesting as the birds. You can't escape the reality that hunting is typically a guy's activity. Yet here's a woman who prefers to hunt on her own in dangerous terrain. This is gonna be a good trip. Back in the woods, we pick up a hoot about 800 feet above sea level. But as we approach his group of trees, he goes quiet. I circle around to try to get a fix on him. With my eyes on the trees, I almost missed the hen sooty on the ground. His hooting had worked. He'd drawn in a female. I quietly take a seat to keep an eye on her, and that's when I notice the male up in the trees in full strut with his air pockets puffed out. It seems that when he saw the hen, he stopped hooting and started displaying. Then when she finally moved, he started hooting again. So it could be like when they just shut up, it could be that there's a hen around. Makes you wonder what you miss. Yeah. Because you're so focused on the sound world. Yeah. I can't stop drawing contrast between my experiences last year and this year. You just really cannot beat local knowledge. Over the next couple days, under Barb's guidance, I get a sense of the rhythm of sooty grouse hunting. The hunt for each bird breaks down into four distinct chapters. Chapter one is hearing the bird. You determine roughly where it's calling from and if it's possible to reach it. He's a little further, but I mean, he's close enough. 
Chapter two is getting close enough to determine which clump of trees the bird is in. Chapter three involves what I now consider to be the iconic image of a sooty grouse hunter, lying flat ass on your back on the forest floor, staring upward in a trance-like state with a set of binos. Man, he's in an impossible spot. And finally, chapter four is making 50 yard or more shots with a double deuce without touching the meat. If he moved forward two inches, I'd be able to maybe take a crack at his head. I don't know how to do that. Every step of the process, I think like, oh, this is the fun part. Like the initial climb, hearing the first hooter way off. And you find the right area, and start looking up the tree. And that really is the actual fun, fun part, is right now where this bird is in one of three trees. Oh my goodness. Oh, look at that. They really do like a site selection where they're broadcasting over such a huge area. Like if you were gonna pick a place to see the maximum amount of ground, it'd be in his tree. Yeah, it is kind of neat when you ultimately found him. Often they're at, the, at a pinnacle. At the end of our last day, we decide to try to find one last bird, a strange one, that we've heard on and off throughout the day without ever being able to pinpoint its distant location. You know he's in that big old spruce. That's what I'm guessing. Sure enough, there he is. Just put the binoculars up and there he is, plain as day, huh? Boy, he's got a nice window. He's broadcasting over everything we've hunted today. We've saved the best for last. <laughs> the tallest tree on the highest spot and our biggest, most gorgeous bird. This is the perfect end to an unforgettable hunt. As soon as he lifts his head up again, I'm gonna, he'll be clear and I'm gonna take a shot. This is the spot of all spots. Mm -hmm. Is it always like this? No, I mean, it's, I've always gotten gross, but uh, this is an exceptionally good day. Do you feel like you've ever hunted like right here before? Um, higher. In fact, if we went higher, I was gonna ask you to keep an eye out for a hat that I lost up there. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. you have hunted up there I have, before. Yeah. I wish you had been with me when I did my other trip. Yeah. Misery, <laughs> it's not like this. It's an underappreciated bird. Yeah, I think so, I like him. It's time for Barb to keep up her end of the bargain, so she is in charge of dinner. Barb is going high class with our final grouse meal. She puts me in charge of the grouse breast while she handles the vegetables. Summer squash, zucchini, green onions, artichoke hearts. Everything gets sliced up and sauteed in butter. Then the ingredients are combined and served over pasta. You have a choice, you have uh, feta cheese or Parmesan, and then there's truffle oil. Really? Barb, you're hardcore. You want a little yogurt on yours? butter on mine, I know that. Wait, it's hot? Mm-hmm. Man, that's good. Isn't it good? Chasing after those birds, you do feel like you wind up walking in places that people probably don't walk. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm the first guy to ever put my foot right here. I'm the first guy to ever put my foot right here. No, it's just a really fun kind of hunting that people don't know about. As long as it's a nice day, it's just so pretty in there that mm -hmm. you just really can't go wrong with 
spending a day like that. Well, Barb, thank you very much. I mean, you solved like one of the great mysteries. It'll be fun now to hear about your next hunt. I am going you, again. Uh, uh, I want to thank you very yeah. much. It's been uh, nice hunting with you. Oh, it was very fun. Thank <laughs> you so much. And I think I still hear a hooter. I heard one down there washing that yeah. thing. <laughs> I'm going to run up there and get them. One year after my sooty grouse disaster, I'm marveling at how these two hunts could turn out so differently. Like I said, there's no substitute in hunting for local knowledge, and there's no substitute in life for the generosity of others, the willingness to take on a stranger and show him the hard-earned secrets of your own world. For that, I thank Barb, who showed me a different way to not just think about hunting, but also to think about hunters. Even in the loneliness of Tongas National Forest, you can't escape the reality that we're bound by a brotherhood and sisterhood that requires us to look out for one another as well as land and the animals upon which we rely. The hunter's heart beats strong.